You'll turn to the prophet Obadiah. We have done um, a number of series, or um, we have completed a number of series over the years. It's been now 17 years, and we have completed 26 books of the Bible in that time. Uh, This will be the 27th book that we have launched into. I have attempted during that time to uh, preach a a variety um, of genres. I like to think that we vary the diet, narrative, gospel, epistle, wisdom, poetry, prophecy, and so forth. It's certainly been my intention. I think that sometimes uh, we've not quite made it. But I had this little window of opportunity, one one week between uh, now and the Christmas services, and so I thought I would attempt a minor prophet. If I'd rem- remember that it was a communion Sunday, I probably would not have tried this. Uh, that's my excuse for if it goes a bit long. Uh, it is a minor prophet, Obadiah is. Minor meaning it is one of the shorter. It doesn't mean it's of minor importance. It is the most minor of the minor prophets, and I believe it is the shortest Old Testament book. It has one of the shortest titles of all of the books of the Bible. The author is unknown. The name means a servant of Jehovah. The date is unknown, though most of the experts uh, say it uh, happened sometime uh, after 587, which you will all know is the date when Babylon dis- the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem. So that would make Obadiah a contemporary of Ezekiel and Jeremiah and Daniel. His message is a message of judgment upon Israel's neighbor Edom in verses 1 through 15, and God's judgment of all the nations of the earth in verses 15 through 18, uh, that judgment coming because of their sins, especially their sins against Israel. And then in verses 19 through 21, the promise of the establishment of God's kingdom. And uh, Obadiah follows the pattern we see throughout the Bible, that those two things always go together. The judgment of the nations and the destruction of the enemies of the people of God go hand in glove with the deliverance of God's people and their establishment and comfort. It is as God judges your enemies that he establishes you and uh, provides uh, the basis for your your security and and comfort and joy. Uh, So God is going to settle accounts. He is going to vindicate his people. He is going to establish here the principle that what you sow, you will reap. So the judgment of Edom in verses 1 through 15 proceeds. Why is Edom to be judged? Number one, because of Edom's pride. Verse 1, the vision of Obadiah, thus says the Lord God concerning Edom. Edom were the ancestral enemies of Israel. They are the descendants of Esau. They were in that territory to the south and east of Israel in the region called Transjordania, that is the other side of the Jordan River. We have heard a report from the Lord. That might be a reference to Jeremiah 49, 7 through 16, where there is a parallel judgment on Edom. And an envoy has been sent, presumably by God, among the nations, saying, Arise, you nations, and let us go against her, that is Edom, for battle. God was rallying the nations to join in the destruction of Edom. Because, uh, why? Because of Edom's pride. And how was Edom's pride manifested? In the following ways. First of all, by relying upon her natural defenses. Verse 2, Behold, I will make you small among the nations. You are greatly despised. The arrogance of your heart has deceived you. You who live in the clefts of the rocks, in the loftiness of your dwelling place, who say in your heart, who will bring me down to earth? What that is referring to is this southeastern region in Palestine that is rugged and mountainous and noted for its natural fortifications. The capital city of Edom was sometimes called Sela, S-E-L-A, also known as Petra, and you may be aware of that. It is a virtually invulnerable fortress, natural fortress area, um, impregnable uh, from outside uh, attack. And uh, so, naturally enough, the Edomites tended to trust in that. Uh, James Montgomery Boyce says, from a human perspective, it was hard to imagine a safer spot 
than Edom and its capital city of Petra. And because they had that natural fortification, they felt safe. They felt uh, as though they were all powerful. They felt as though they were invulnerable. They uh, were beyond attack. They, uh, they, uh, and, and because of that, pride crept in. They were alienated from God. They uh, were puffed up with arrogance. And what God says then in verse 4, though you build high like the eagle, though you set your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. If thieves came to you, if robbers by night, oh, how you will be ruined, would they not steal only until they had enough? In other words, robbers come and steal from you. They take some things, but they leave a lot behind. Uh, if gate gatherers came to you, would they not leave some gleanings? Likewise, you pick the crop, but there's also always some left behind. This judgment, however, will not be like that. Oh, how Esau will be ransacked and his hidden treasures, never mind the things that are out in the open, even the hidden treasures searched out. The judgment will be complete. Your ruin will be absolute. It would be much uh, like the United States today, taking confident in its status today as the lone superpower, thinking of itself as impregnable, invulnerable. Uh, when I was growing up, it was a bipolar world. You remember, that's the way we spoke of it. There was the United States and there was the Soviet Union. And then the Berlin Wall we came down in 1989. A few years after that, the Soviet Union collapsed. And that left what? That left us. We were called superpowers because prior to that, we spoke of the great powers, Britain, France, Germany, the United States, uh, Russia. The great powers were overtaken by the superpowers. Then one of the superpowers collapsed. Who did that leave? The United States, now sometimes called a hyperpower. We are so beyond the power of any other nation, impregnable, invulnerable, invincible. Can we not be brought down from our heights? Well, of course we can. And so beware. That's the message to Edom. You are not impregnable. You are vulnerable. Beware. Don't become puffed up with pride. So they became proud, number one, because of their reliance upon their natural defenses and not relying upon God. Number two, they trusted in their alliances. All the men allied with you will send you forth to the border and the men at peace with you will deceive you and overpower you. They who eat your bread, in other words, your friends, your allies, those with whom you are in alliance, will set an ambush for you. There is no understanding in, in him. They were trusting in their alliances. Number three, the third manifestation of their pride. They relied upon their natural defenses. They trusted in their alliances and they were confident in their wisdom. Verse eight. Well, I not in that day, declares the Lord, destroy wise men from Edom and understanding from the mountain of Esau. Then your mighty men will be dismayed. O Teman, Teman is another city in Edom noted for its wise men. Jo Job's counselor, uh, Eliphaz, uh, was from Teman. Then your mighty men will be dismayed. O Teman in order that everyone may be cut off from the mountain of Esau by slaughter. They were trusting in their wisdom and their alliances and their natural defenses. You cannot trust in the United Nations. You cannot trust in NATO and CETO and your alliances. You cannot trust in your technology and your tactics and your generals. It's just amazing today how we watch cruise missiles go through uh, planes of glass at which they are targeted from 500 miles away. It's astonishing the technological superiority that we have in this nation. We can't even join in, in uh, the kind of joint uh, military efforts with the nations of Europe because they're so technologically behind us. They're not even a help to us. They can put boots on the ground for us, but they, they can hardly fight together with us because they're just so far behind us. Even though that is the case, does that mean we're safe? Does that mean we should be proud? Does that mean that we as a nation or any nation should have confidence in, in, in our wisdom, in, in our treaties and alliances, and, and in our military power? Even from great heights, God can and will bring down the proud. 
And that's the message to Edom. So number one, God is judging Edom because of Edom's pride. Number two, because of Edom's treachery. Verse 10, because of violence to your brother Jacob, you will be covered with shame. You will be cut off forever. Remember, Esau and Jacob were brothers. That makes the Edomites and the Israelites seen as descendants, brothers, or cousins. Right? Your fathers were brothers. That makes you cousins. Now, what did Edom do on the day of Israel's distress? On uh, the day of Israel, their cousins troubled. What did the Edomites do? Number one, they stood aloof. Verse 11, on that day that you stood aloof, on the day that strangers carried off his wealth, invading armies, in other words, going in and looting the city, what did you do? And foreigners entered the gate and cast lots for Jerusalem. You, too, were as one of them. You were virtually contributing to what was going on. You just stood aloof. You offered no help. You stood with them. You watched. If you've ever been attacked by, by, by uh, another, and those who were your friends, those who were your loved ones, just stood by and, and did nothing, offered no help, offered uh, no word of encouragement, did not join in your defense, just stood there dumb, said nothing as you were being attacked. You, you will know the sense of this. What did Edom do when Israel was under attack? It did nothing to help stood aloof, watched. More than that, they gloated, snickered, celebrated, sneered. Verse 12, do not gloat over your brother's day, the day of his misfortune. And do not rejoice over the sons of Judah in the day of their destruction. Yes, do not boast in the day of their distress. Boasting what? Boasting, oh, it'll never happen to us. We're strong. We're powerful. We're safe. We're secure. Uh, snickering, sneering, celebrating, gloating over the destruction of your cousin, your brothers, the Israelites. Uh, third, they even joined in the attack. You kicked them while they were down. Do not enter the gate of my people. You came in just like the conquerors. The Babylonians came through the gates. Do not enter the gate of my people in the day of their disaster. Yes, you do not gloat over their calamity in the day of their disaster and do not loot their wealth in the day of their disaster. You came in while we were prostrate on the ground and you came in and you kicked us and robbed us. Do not stand at the fork of the road as refugees presumably were in flight, weak and distressed and, 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 and troubled. And you cut them down. Do not stand at the fork of the road to cut down their their fug two fugitives. Do not imprison their survivors in the day of their distress. They robbed them, they captured them, and they sold them into slavery. Those who were fleeing from attackers, those who were fugitives in a time of war. The psalmist in the 137th Psalm says this, Psalm 137, 7 of Edom in the time of Jerusalem's destruction. Remember, O Lord, against the sons of Edom, the day of Jerusalem, who said, raise it, raise it to its very foundation. That's what uh, their cousins, the Edomites, did. They cheered. They were pleased. They were thrilled to watch Jerusalem be destroyed and leveled and burned to the ground. Are they going to get away with it? Are they going to get away with their pride? Are they going to get away with their treachery for standing aloof, gloating and celebrating and joining in the attack, looting the, the children of Israel, attacking their fugitives, selling uh, their people into slavery? Verse 15, no, for the day of the Lord draws near on all nations. As you have done, it will be done to you. That is the expression of God's perfect justice. You get no more and no less than what you deserve. What do you deserve? You deserve to have happened to you exactly as you have done. That's the principle of the lex talionis. That's the principle of an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth. It's strict justice. Don't think of that as being somehow unfair. It's perfectly fair. You knock out somebody's eye, your eye gets knocked out. You kill somebody, you forfeit your own life. 
What is done is perfectly equitable. It's not more than you should uh, be punished. It's not less than you should be punished. Why? Because you are receiving exactly what you dealt out. As you have done, it will be done. Your dealings will return on your own head. Why? Because of your pride and because of your treachery. You will be judged. And then in verse 15, as we see, Obadiah shifts from God's judgment on Edom to all the nations, this principle of perfect equity, as you have done it will be done to you, applies not just to Edom, but to all the nations of the world. For in the day, the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord's judgment, in other words, the day that the Lord comes in judgment, it draws near on who? On all the nations, including the Edomites. And the principle of strict justice, as it has been, as, as you have done, it will be done to you, applies not just to the Edomites, but to all the nations of the world. And about that judgment, we can say this. It is universal. It is all nations. It is imminent. It draws near. And it is fair. It is as you have done. Does that sound like an Old Testament principle to you? No. Galatians 6. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. It's the law of sowing and reaping. What you sow, you will reap. You sow of the flesh, you will reap destruction. It's built into the fabric of the universe. It is a principle of God's justice, of his judgment, that you get what you deserve. You sow the wind, you reap the whirlwind. You sow the flesh, you reap destruction. You sow righteousness, you reap eternal life. You get what you deserve. What you indulge comes back to you. Your investment returns to you. You invest in sin, in the flesh, that's what will come back to you. You invest in righteousness and godliness uh, and in the things of God, then you will multiply for all eternity the benefits thereof. So as you have done, it will be done to you. Lamentations 4, uh, 21 and 22. Jeremiah says, Rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Edom, who dwells in the land of Uz. But the cup will come around to you as well. That cup, that bitter cup from which Israel is drinking, don't gloat because you will drink it too. You will become drunk and make yourself naked, drinking from the winepress of the wrath of God, the Almighty. It will come back to you. Verse 16, because just as you drank on my holy mountain, all the nations will drink. The drinking there presumably being the drinking of celebration as they were rejoicing in the destruction of, of Israel. You have drunk on my holy mountain. Now all the nations will drink continually. They will drink and swallow and become as if they had never existed. Yes, you'll have quite a party, a party where you, you are consumed by the wrath of God. Verse 17, But on Mount Zion there will be those who escape, and it will be holy. And the house of Jacob will possess their possessions. God will preserve a remnant. And like I said at the outset, these two are always together. The destruction of the enemies of Israel goes hand in glove with the redemption, the salvation of the people of God. They will possess their possessions. There will be a great reversal that will take place one day. And though now the, the enemies of the people of God triumph over God's people. One day there will be a great reversal and the meek will inherit the earth and justice and righteousness will be restored. Verse 18, then the house of Jacob will be a fire and the house of Joseph a flame, but the house of Esau will be as stubble. That is Jacob and Joseph there, those two names signifying the whole people of God, all 12 tribes will be as a fire participating in the destruction of Esau. Esau will be as stubble. It will burst into flame. They, Jacob and Joseph, will set them, the Edomites, the house of Esau, on fire and consume them so that there will be no survivor of the house of Esau. For the Lord has spoken. This is a, a terrible judgment of which Obadiah speaks. The judgments of God are terrible indeed. There will be no survivor, he says. Uh, 
Esau will be consumed, he says. There's a terror about the judgment day, is there not? It's certain, it's comprehensive, it's universal. And perhaps most terrifying of all is that it's fair. You're judged according to your deeds. What you have sown, you reap. For most of us, now I'll correct that, for all of us, that's bad news. If we're judged according to our deeds, we're in big trouble. That's, what's, uh, that's the problem for the Edomites and the nations of the world. God is going to judge them according to the standard of justice as you have done. It will be done to you. You will reap what you have sown. That's bad news for the world. That's bad news for us. That's the prelude to the gospel. That's why uh, the gospel of Christ is good news. Why? Because we need a savior. We're in trouble. We need a deliverer. We need someone to rescue us from this coming judgment that is so certain and so terrible and, and universal and consuming and exhaustive. We need a savior to save us and deliver us from the wrath that is to come. That's not just the message of the Old Testament. We need to be plucked from the fires, Jude, Jude, Jude says. The writers of the New Testament speak of the, the gospel of Jesus Christ who rescues us from the wrath that is to come. That is a continuing theme from Genesis to Revelation. And that day of judgment, it is certain we will stand before God. We will be judged for our deeds, for the deeds done in the body, whether good or ill. We will reap what we have sown. It will be done to us as we have done. And that's bad news. And that's why we need good news. That's why we need a gospel. That's why we look for deliverance and rescue from the day of judgment and wrath. And that's why we look uh, to God's provision in Jesus. Uh, we look to him uh, to cover our sins and to take away our guilt. So that in on the judgment day we will stand clothed in his righteousness. And God will see us in him and not in ourselves. Because in ourselves, we're doomed. In ourselves, we fall under the same sentence that falls upon Edom and upon the nations. And then lastly, Obadiah addresses the establishment of God's kingdom in verses 19 through 21. Then those of the Negev. Now, what he begins to indicate here is that Israel will move in the four cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west. Israel now defeated. Israel carried off as a remnant. Edom scorned and mocked by uh, its enemies and by the nations will one day be restored and that kingdom will grow and it will expand north, south, east, and west. And so he indicates that by the points on the compass and by the, uh, those uh, the cities and, and regions that, that are uh, the, the, in the, those directions away from Jerusalem indicating the expansion of the kingdom of God in those directions, but ultimately its expansion over all the earth, encompassing all the nations of the world. So then those of the Negev, that uh, Negev is the southern wilderness area in the direction of, of Edom. Those in the Negev will possess the mountain of Esau, and those of the Shepelah, the Shepelah, the foothills to the west, those coastal hills before the plain of the Philistines, before the ocean, it's, or the Mediterranean Sea itself. Those are the Shepala, the Philistine plain. So those who are in those foothills will move all the way to the coast in the west. Also, they will possess the territory of Ephraim and the territory of Samaria. Ephraim and Samaria were to the north. So the Negev to the south. The Shepala to the west, Ephraim and Samaria to the north, and Benjamin will possess Gilead and the exiles of this host of the sons of Israel. Gilead is in Transjordania to the east. So do you see what he's saying? South, west, north, east. Israel will be established. It will overcome its enemies in each of those four cardinal directions. The kingdom of God overcoming the, the nations. Verse, verse 20, 
and the exiles of this host of the sons of Israel, that is, those who have been carried off into captivity, who are among the Canaanites as far as uh, Zarephath, um, which was up north between Tyre and Sidon, those who were carried off in that direction to the north, will possess the cities of the Negev. To the south, they will come back from in the north, way up in the north. They will come all the way back down and possess the south. And those who are among, uh, uh, and the exiles, rather, of Jerusalem, who are in Shepherdad, now, where exactly that is, nobody knows, except it's off somewhere in the middle of the Babylonian Empire. So way off in the north, as well as perhaps way off in the east, even from there they will come all the way back and possess the lands all the way in the south, in the Negev, down in the land of the Edomites. So what's the point of, of this? Well, the, the point is that this seemingly impossible situation will become a reality. This is, this, is, this is being prophesied after the remnant of Israel has been carried off to Babylon. The, the annihilation of, the, of the, the nation has taken place. The odds against this are, are, are just in, 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 incalculable. The likelihood of this, it would seem to be impossible. How could they ever come back? and possess the land, and not only possess it, but expand its borders north and south and east and west. How could it happen? Yet that's what's being promised. In spite of present appearances, the kingdom will be established. Verse 21, the deliverers will ascend Mount Zion, that is Jerusalem, to judge the mountain of Esau, to judge and rule over the descendants of Esau, the Edomites, and the kingdom will be the Lord. Now, what does this mean in, in summary and conclusion? It means that the suffering of the people of God, even under the hand of God's judgment, is temporary. It will not last. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, speaks of the suffering of the people of God as a temporary phenomenon. It's temporary light affliction, he says there. You might say, well, he, he doesn't know how much I suffer. Well, there's plenty of suffering going on in the early church, the Church of the Apostles. But for him, that's just light, temporary, light affliction. Uh, Romans 8.18, the suffering of this present time is not worthy to be compared to the glory that is to be revealed. Our suffering's temporary. Even if it's suffering under the, the disciplining hand of our Father in heaven, it's temporary. Even if it manifests itself in the triumph of the enemies of the people of God, even if it means the scorn and ridicule and mocking of, of God's people, it's temporary. God's kingdom will be established. We have a better and abiding possession, it says in Hebrews 10, 34. And... Not only is our suffering temporary, but our deliverance and our establishment is certain and soon. The Apostle Paul calls this our blessed hope. Christ will return in victory and triumph and establish his eternal kingdom. Comfort one another with these words, 1 Thessalonians 4.18. We are sowing the Spirit. We will reap eternal life. The meek ones of God will indeed inherit the earth. Does that not transform uh, current uh, circumstances? Does that not change the way that you read the newspaper? Does that not make a difference as you consider your own um, troubles and trials and tribulations? To know that it's temporary? To know that it has a purpose? To, the, to know that deliverance shall come? That we shall be established? That the kingdoms of this world, as we remember this morning, shall become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ? And when we come to the Lord's table, it, it is anticipation of that day when we join in the marriage supper of the Lamb. Where we are invited to come and to dine with Him in the kingdom of God, in eternity, in heaven. To dine with Him and enjoy fellowship with Him forever and ever and ever. With the King of kings and the Lord of lords, whose kingdom is an abiding and an eternal kingdom that shall never end 
where justice and righteousness will be established forever and forever. And we will be safe, saved, uh, provisioned, and loved as we pray together. Our Father in heaven, we give thanks, O Lord, that you raised up your servant Obadiah. And we give thanks, O Lord, that you are a God who knows, who knows all things, who is aware, and who promises that no one gets away with anything, that we will reap what we have sown. You will judge our enemies, and you will deliver us and establish us. And we will enjoy your presence and the fullness of joy therein forever and ever and ever. And, O oh Lord, as we turn to your table, may our hearts be as one. Meet with us, O oh Lord, we pray, as we break bread together in the observance of this sacrament. In Jesus' name, amen.